Most of us love a good myth. Myths engage our imagination, help us explain natural phenomena, and provide guidance on navigating the unknown. Every industry has myths. The cleaning industry is no exception. And besides myths, we all enjoy a good myth-busting tale, and that's why we're here today. I'm pleased to welcome our myth-busting expert, Brandon Beyer, the Technical Development Manager, North America for Univar Solutions. Brandon, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jeff. Happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are a myth-busting expert. Brandon Beyer, I'm a Technical Development Manager for Univar Solutions. I have a, I'm a chemist by training, a total synthesis guy. But I've spent the last 20 plus years of my, my entire career has been spent in HI&I as either a producer, a formulator out in the field. Uh, so I'd say the myth busting expertise comes from firsthand experience. A lot of it's data driven myth busting, not just my feelings, facts over feelings. So Brandon, besides your own expertise, tell us about Univar Solutions. A uh, Univar Solutions is a chemical distributor. The general perception of a chemical distributor is just big bulk commodities, caustic bleach, which is actually really relevant for the industrial crowd. Uh, the reality is though, there's a lot of innovation that comes out of a company like Univar. Myself, my team, there's a whole lab uh, group behind us that helps actually generate a lot of uh, meaningful, impactful data. You're not just washing with caustic, you're not just washing with bleach, there's surfactants, polymers, keelants, so I sit within the specialty space. There's a commodity side and a specialty side. And the specialty is often where a lot of the magic happens for cleaning. Okay. Well, are you ready to bust some myths? I am. The first one is green cleaning. Some say that products don't work and they're too expensive. Bust that myth for us. It's half a myth. Um, so green does clean. So that, that's something you can take to the bank. There are some challenges with green cleaning. One is the first word green. Green means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It could mean bio-based, it could mean bio-renewable, um, biodegradable. So a lot of times when you're talking to a customer or an end user, you have to first define what is green. Green washing is a very real phenomenon and it's starting to become under the, you know, I'd say attack by legislation. So you can't just make these false claims. The reality is, I would say when I define green cleaning, it has it comes down to the raw materials you're using. So they're biorenewable, they're sustainable, uh, and there's a lot of old chemistries made in new ways. So where they used to just come from petrol and synthetic feedstocks, they can now come from bio-based feedstocks. So they do clean. So something like a linear alcohol ethoxylate is ubiquitous across the industry, but you can get a synthetic version or a bio-based version. We know they work. Something like a nonophenol ethoxylate has a lot of environmental baggage. <laughs> it cleans really, really well, but no one's looking for a green, sustainable way to make something that's an endocrine disruptor, right? But then you have things like uh, enzymes and microbes that are just inherently green and are purpose-built for what they do, and they're fantastic. Uh, one of the caveats is some of these things cost a bit more, which is often a challenge for the industrial space. They're more price sensitive. But green does clean. It just usually comes at a price. You said some of those chemical terms like you, you've you been doing that this a while. Yeah, well, you know, they, I'm on here because I'm supposed to be a subject matter expert. Um, <laughs> I apologize. You are. Yeah, they are 10 cent words. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've been a chemist my entire career. So I I jump in and out of the terminology. Exactly. No, I value, I value people that know those terms because I surely don't. Um, okay, we busted the myth on green cleaning. Our next one is rinsing solutions. Some say you need to rinse surfaces with just water. Others say you need a chemical product. Bust that myth for us. It depends. So yes, you can always rinse with just water. Nothing's going to stop you from doing that. Uh, the, the question here or what, what really gets to is you can be a more efficient rinsing or you can make your rinsing almost part of the cleaning process. What do I mean? Part of the cleaning process, one of the biggest challenges we see, say, in plates, dishes, stemware, hard water spots. You see this in car wash. You see this at home. You don't just rinse with water in a, in a washing machine. You use some type of polymer, some type of keelant, basically conditioning the water um, for hardness. So you don't leave hard water spots. 
The other spot is um, EOPO copolymers. What are those? They're rinse aids. They're, they're quickening the time at which the water sheds from a surface, which again reduces the chance of spotting, uh, reduces the wash time, reduces the drying time. It makes everything more efficient. You see them in dish, you see them in car wash. Again, the chemistry doesn't care. The chemistry is going to do the same thing on a different surface. So yes, you can just rinse with water, but it might take longer. It might leave some residue. It might leave some soils. So you can improve your rinsing step in a number of applications. Another myth we're going to bust, you mentioned it already, enzymes. Some believe in them, others avoid them. Some say they have too many restrictions, maybe it's temperature or time, and often they don't work. I don't know. Can you bust that myth for us? That's a total myth. So I have two lives with enzymes when it comes to formulation. When I first started, uh, they took a lot of work to formulate with. You'd start with the enzyme and build a formulation around it. A lot of that had to do with the stability package. So some of the limitations had, what could you do with the enzyme? There is a lot of innovation in this space uh, and a lot of understanding in how to formulate with them. They are, with enzymes, they are purpose-built with a billion years of evolution. So what they do, they do better than anything else. You can have any number of surfactant combinations you want, but if you want to go after like a biological soil like blood, a starch, some fats, nothing does better than an enzyme. And it just keeps doing its job again and again and again in solution. Um, that being said, you know, a waxy lipstick, some of the cosmetics, it will have zero impact. It is not, nature didn't build something to remove lipstick from a pillowcase. So they, they need to be used judiciously, but where they are used, they enable all sorts of unique innovations. Reduced water, dropping the temperature down to near room temperature, um, as opposed to say 40 Celsius, 50 Celsius, 60 Celsius, the temperatures we see in, in typical industrial applications. Um, do they have restrictions? Mainly just application. You know, they're, they're phenomenal in laundry, they're phenomenal in dish. Uh, we're seeing more food and beverage applications like clean in place for breweries, dairy, where again, you're dealing with biological soils that the enzymes are just built to, to work with. So combining them with a little bit of surfactant. So once you remove the soil from a fabric or a surface and keeping it flowing in solution in the micelle, I mean, it's the best of both worlds. You're blending mechanisms to, to do a perfect task. And I just think the enzymes enable step changes in soil removal. So it's, it's a myth. If anyone tells you they don't work, they're not good. They just need to be a little more um, educated on what they currently can do. I like that information. Send me some enzymes. I have some stuff to clean. <laughs> we'll do. Uh, no, it makes sense. Uh, you, you talk about what it won't do. Oil and water don't mix. You have to think about chemical compatibility. So yeah, you know, it's it's a really powerful tool. It just comes with some guidelines. And, and there are some things that challenge an enzyme, right? Enzymes aren't just big, long protein structures. They're huge, but they're folded up around some basic ions like calcium, magnesium. A lot of formulations have things, keelants, that pull calcium and magnesium out of water. So you have to be careful that you don't destroy the enzyme. If you can think of the enzyme as a big folded ball, once it unfolds, it's not folding back up in solution to start its work again. It's it's denatured. It's dead. This puts some limitations on it too because some things can kill an enzyme, caustic and bleach. However, especially in the industrial cleaning space, you can often split cycles. So you can have an enzyme process, say like in laundry for 8, 10, 12 minutes, do a drain, and then hit it with caustic and bleach. The enzyme has done the bulk of its work. And then you can leverage some of those more commodity cleaning agents and get the best of both worlds. All right. Fantastic. Our next one, number four, it's a word called tact. And many understand it to be, and there's other variations of this, time, agitation, chemical temperature. Some call it the cleaning pie. Some say that if you reduce one, you must increase the other to the same extent. Easy as pie, pun intended. Bust that myth for us. Is that the correct way of looking at it? You know, I wouldn't say, so the, the, it's not a myth. Uh, the the I would say that's true, but it's not an equal proportion, right? You're, there are no shortcuts, only trade-offs. Time is great. If you take something, take 
dish is some di like manual dish is something we all have an intuitive understanding of because we wash our dishes. Why do some people just put stuff in the sink and soak it with just a tiny bit of soap? It starts the process. You're using time as one of your metrics. You have a little bit of chemistry. The heat fades over time, right? And then you have one of the things that people forget, sweat equity, mechanical action, you can always add in, right? So that's, the, you're working with these bits and pieces, but in my space, I'm a chemist. So what I wanna do is maximize the chemistry so you can reduce the time, you can reduce the water, you can reduce the energy. You can do everything as much as possible with chemistry. But a lot of times, if you look at places, let's say laundry in much of the developing world, they don't have a lot of control. You know, a good portion of the population spends days in tubs and streams doing laundry. They have basic tallow, sweat equity, and whatever temperature nature derives, and they have time. So when you're, you know, it really depends. And you see all these interesting applications of that cleaning pie. But I would say it's not equal proportions. The whole goal of my team and the suppliers behind me when they innovate is to try and get as much as possible out of that chemical component. So it's a disproportionate application. You add, say, one unit in of chemistry and, say, 50 units across the place. I mean, that's a generic number, but it's kind of a myth. But I just say, like, there's a lot of nuance there. Yeah, it's about balance and and making things work. I like your sweat equity explanation. <laughs> the agitation is so important. It is. I mean, and you think of usually hear stories about the toughest soils. So someone gets like a, a really nasty stain on a shirt they love. What do you do? You add a pre-spotter and you let it sit for a bit. You're adding time. You might scrub it, some sweat equity, because the washing machine itself can only do so much. It's either top loader or front loader, front loader. It's agitating. But not as much as as a person would do with and also not like as targeted um and that's why a lot of say pre-spotters are a bit of a gel they're not a liquid you want them to sit there so add residence time on the soil all right number five caustics and bleaches you've mentioned them but some say that they're too dangerous to use the safety factors outweigh their benefits bust that myth for us so i would use um an appeal to time on this one. And time, I mean, it's like if they're so dangerous and they're too dangerous, they've been used for decades and decades and decades. Yes, they're, it's chemistry, right? And all chemists respect the power of chemistry. The great thing with caustic and bleach is they they can't say, um, put a crater in the earth, right? There are, it's not like you're making an explosive, but they do come with the requirement for, you know, PPE, safety glasses, whatnot, but they're extremely cheap. And they're extremely effective cleaning agents. And in the case of bleach, it comes with the benefit of a lot of disinfecting, which oftentimes you may take a little risk, but you need that risk so people don't get sick, especially say like in a hospital environment, a food environment. Both are really important. So to say they're too dangerous, I think is um is a is not accurate. You know, are they dangerous? Yes, too dangerous. No, they just need to be handled with care. Yeah, and use proper PPE, gloves, goggles. It makes sense. Yeah, and, and again, you know, it, it's you're you don't have limitless resources in terms of finances for, for as a as a customer or consumer. I would love, trust me, I am incentivized for people to buy as much chemistry as possible and use it all in the world. But at the same time, uh, Costa can do a lot. It can cover a lot of sins. It, it's used um, a ton in food and beverage because, again, food soils will break down in the presence of high alkali. You can just make it work a little bit better with the addition of some surfactant, polymer, or whatnot. But too dangerous? No. Dangerous? Yes. All right. Let's talk about our final myth, somewhat of a myth, the cost of products. Those watching our program today want to use the best cleaning products and save within their budget. Can you spend more money on products and yet still save money in the long run? Talk about that. Bust that myth. You know, I, yes. And this comes back to that cleaning wheel. I think a lot of times it comes into temperature and, and water. So anytime you have to heat water, you're burning resources. Resources in the form of money. It costs a lot. It takes a lot of energy in terms of gas to heat water. You use the water then to clean whatever you're cleaning. And anything that enables a reduction in water temperature or water usage is a waste. So you spend a little to potentially save a lot. And it isn't, 
I would encourage an audience to think beyond just saving uh, financially. You know, there's a lot of attention to the environment. Uh, you, you can debate what actually is happening with with uh, the weather. But what I could say is like, it's it's like recycling. You recycle one can. Is that going to change the overall waste of the world? No, but it's, it's a directional step in, 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 you know, a positive way. So if you can use a little bit of chemistry and spend a few pennies more, you will save some money in water and energy, potentially, again, very much depends on the application. But you're also probably doing the right thing to try and support a more, you know, sustainable environment. So, yes, it, it's, a, it's a caveat because industrial in particular is very price sensitive. They would like, you know, that's the every week, every day I get questions. I want, I want it to clean everything. I want it to cost nothing. And, you know, I don't even want to apply it. I hope it applies itself. That's not realistic. Uh, so you're trying to like manage expectations, but the expectation is if they spend a little, they should be able to get some return on their investment somewhere else in their process. Yes. Thank you for those. Um, let's, let's wrap up with this. Do you have any final thoughts or words of advice for our audience? You know, Jeff, one thing I wanted to volunteer is uh, a benefit of Univar Solutions, as I'd mentioned earlier, is we do have solution centers and labs. Uh, and we're all tapped for resources, time, personnel, and, and lab resources are challenging. So please reach out, use our knowledge, use our lab resources. We do projects every single day trying to help customers refine their formulations, do competitive benchmarking, looking for new ingredients and new innovations. That literally is the funnest part of my job. Um, so I look forward to it. And we like to look at it as a collaboration, a way we can work together, ultimately boiling it down to what problem are you trying to solve? Because we have the labs and the people to help support you. Mm -hmm.